Hello, everybody. Welcome back to episode two of the Gratis group chat. We finally decided on a name. I felt like Gratis by itself was like not long enough and it needed something added to it. So I feel like Gratis group chat is like the best way to describe what we have going on here. And I hope you guys like the name because if you don't, I don't know. I don't have anything better. Things are very cozy today here in my fun little studio. We have gotten 12 inches of snow in 12 hours. So, I mean, we've gotten like over a foot overnight and it's not going to stop for the rest of the day. So there's no time like the present to do episode two of the podcast. Now you might be asking, why didn't you really promote this podcast until you had two episodes? There's a few reasons. One, I like to binge things. I like to watch TV shows when they have a lot of episodes, or I like to listen to podcasts when they have a couple episodes. I don't like to just sit in one episode and then be done and have to wait a week. So I wanted to give that and pay that forward to people who are listening. But number two, I also can be monetized if I have two episodes. And I think people have a lot of interest when podcasts first come out and then they can lose interest or they can kind of waver. And so I was like, you know what? The the time and the work it takes to put this thing together, I'm going to get my coin. I'm going to get my coin out of it. So that's why we have two episodes now. So please enjoy both of them. Welcome back if you listened to episode one or if you didn't just welcome to the podcast. Today, our subject is called the epicenter of friendships. I came across a tweet last week from a man named Jack Daly Barnes, and his tweet said, the thing about romanticizing sitcom friend group hangouts like Eric's Basement and That 70s Show or Central Perk and Friends is that they don't exist anymore. The epicenter of friendship is no longer physical. And his tweet continued, but I felt like it wasn't as relevant. But it reminded me of two different conversations I've had with my friend Ani in the last six months. The first conversation was on adult friendships and how they change. And then the second was a concept called third spaces. So we're going to dig into both of those subjects a little bit today. But I'm hoping that most of you listening will resonate with this to one degree or another, or at least it'll get you thinking um, on a couple of important topics like friendships and how you act as a friend and what kind of friends you should have in your life and how adult friendships change and grow and how the places surrounding those adult friendships also change and grow. Probably around six months ago, Ani and I were talking about how adult friendships really change and merge and kind of drop off in your 20s. I noticed in my early 20s, you would have groups of friends. So these would be people who maybe were friends from school or from a hobby or from a sport or if you're religious from church or from a religious affiliation. And you would have these groups, teams, clubs. That's what a lot of friendships are based off of is um, four plus people in a group and how they related to each other on things that they enjoyed or things that they believed in, moral values, religious values, or just a situation in life, scenario in life, life stage, things like college or schooling or training for a trade or something like that. We had friends that really were a friend group. They really revolved around a group think, kind of a group mentality. And I've noticed as I've gotten older, and she pointed this out too, Your friendships change for sure with maturity, but they also, the layout of friendships kind of change. Instead of going to this group for this activity or this group for this type of support, now you may have one singular or a few stragglers left of every group. And so you have these two people from this thing, this one person from this experience, this one person from this life stage, and you're at the center. So you may have seven friends, but they don't all relate to each other anymore. They only relate to you. Up until about 25 years old, I had these friend groups with four plus people And they all brought something different to the table, whether it be like our memories, things we enjoy, life experience, whatever that situation may be, they all brought something different, but there was a group of people. And I would say past the age of 25, that's really diminished and changed. And so there's this weird 
loneliness with friends lately where I can't really go to a group of people and get what I need in terms of friendship. And I also can't go to a group of people and give what I have to that group of people. I have to kind of maneuver between individuals in order to get and give what I'm used to receiving and giving. Each one of these individuals brings something important to the table, which is really nice. But when I had a group of people, they all would bring that by themselves. They all would bring a different life experience, different memories, different things in common, different values that we held true. Um, and now I'm kind of friends with individuals who hold different aspects, but it's hard because you can't really come together in a friend group and hang out because this person doesn't have any relation to this person. They're from different stages of life. And I think if you are over the age of 25 or you are getting into your upper 20s and like early 30s and you still have these friend groups, I think you are very lucky and I think you should be grateful to have those friend groups because in my experience and the experience of my friends, that's very, very rare. But because of this feeling, I find myself often escaping into a show like Friends or I used to watch that 70s show. I don't as much now, but a show like that, which reflects the kind of friendship group I would want in my late 20s and early 30s and I don't have or I don't have yet. I don't know if that ever comes back. I have not heard from anyone over the age of 30 that you ever really get that back outside of maybe like a group, like a church group sense or a religious group sense. You won't really have um, people in a group setting or a group form anymore but that's it makes it easy to escape in that type of media because it feels like you're part of that group even though you don't know any of those people. I think this feeling really came to a head in July of this year when my friend Linnea got married. The day of I was on this emotional high and it's just one of those like top five days in your life where this person who feels like a sister to you who you've grown up with since high school like gets married and it was just such a wonderful day. But then the days following, I kind of fell into this wild, like unexpected depression. Um, and that carried on for about a month. And then the next month after that was kind of apathy and numbness. And I think um, just trying to come to terms with what I was feeling. And I remember calling my cousin Kim and being like, I don't know what's going on. I like maybe I just have bad friends in my day to day, but there's something that stands out from this bachelorette group or like these bridesmaids from this wedding. And I don't feel like I have that anywhere else in my life. And so at the time, what I thought it was, was like, I just must have bad friends. And this has just made it very apparent, you know, and I was talking to my friend Kim and she was like, I don't know. I don't know if it's that you have bad friends. Maybe they just bring something different to the table. And it took a couple months, but what I realized they brought to the table was this was the first time that I really felt like I had a group of people around me in a long time. And so the reason that I think it hit me so hard in July versus when we got together in March, because that's when we first, I knew some of them because they're her sisters. Uh, but then when we got together in March, we had a bachelorette weekend. And I think the reason it didn't hit me then is because I immediately went from that to staying with a friend in Oceanside for half a week to staying with another friend in Los Angeles for a week. And that friend had a lot of friends that would just come in and out of their house and there was definitely a group setting there. So I, I felt like I kind of got to step down a little bit each person before I headed home and prepare myself to go home and back to real life versus this wedding I felt like we all got together again and it was so incredible and amazing and what a beautiful day. And then the next day it was just back to real life and everybody flew home to their respective states and areas in the country and we didn't have that friendship. And since then, I have seen some of them, like I've seen her family when I've gone to pick her up when she's in town or I saw Carolyn when I went to San Francisco in October and visited Linnea or I saw Ashley. We had dinner in November. So like I've seen, again, each of them individually, but I haven't seen that group since July and I probably will never see that group in totality again for the rest of my life. I might see little individuals here or there, like tiny groups of like duos 
throughout my life, but I don't think I will see all of them again. And I think that's what I was struggling with and craving and working through at that time is that I'd finally had something that felt like that again. And it, as quickly as it came, it left. So that was kind of where my mind was going with that first conversation uh, in relation to this tweet about friendships. Like, first of all, what is an adult friendship? And adult friendships change and they grow and they're odd. And even people that you knew, like I'm still friends with girls that I was friends with when I was like eight years old. And it's interesting because they have been kind of the same person until like 24, 25. And I think they also individually changed. So even when I can identify like I have this friend group over here of four women we're all very different than who we were even two years ago. So it's kind of hard to still anticipate, not like anticipate who I'm going to get when I hang out with them, but to anticipate what their life stage is or where they're going with their life or what's going to change or what has changed and kind of like navigating different relationships or different uh, ways of relating to one another, I guess. But the second conversation that came to mind was another one I'd had with my friend Ani back in October when we were in Boston, and we discussed the concept of third spaces. This definition is taken from the Third Space Network website. I have no idea what that website is about. If it's like some awful group, please don't associate me with them. I was just looking up this definition, and I thought it was pretty good. A third space is a socio-cultural term to designate communal space as distinct from the home, which is a first space, or work, which is a second space. It is a space where an individual can experience a sense of self, identity, and relationship to others. A third space can be broken down into two categories, physical and parasocial. Now, this isn't part of their definition. This is how I'm defining it because I see two different types of third spaces. A physical one would be like a museum, a sports center, a nightclub, or a theater. Anywhere that can make you feel out of your ordinary, a place where you can escape into. You can escape into a concert. You can escape into art. You can escape into a sport and a game and get really involved in that and kind of forget about what's going on in the on the outer rim of your life. The second category of third spaces is parasocial. So things like social media, YouTube, virtual reality, anything like that. So there's kind of this physical escape. You go to a physical place and you escape from things. And then there's a parasocial where you go to a phone or a social media app or a website or um, virtual reality and you escape from real life out here and what's going on around you. So then tying that together to the epicenter of friendship, there are three areas where I see friend groups coming together most often, third spaces, public spaces, and private spaces. We just discussed what a third space is, and I believe that going to third spaces is important because it allows you to fully escape, as I was saying before, um, from a situation or a scenario, and you get a full, like 100% break from whatever is going on. A public space, again, I'm defining because some people would say a place like a library, a restaurant, or a coffee shop, that's a third space. And it is, but it isn't in my opinion because you can still have an overlap of the, the home or the work life within that space, right? Like it's an overlap of real life and escapism. For example, you may do a project in a coffee shop. You might work on a paper or work on a group project together for school in a coffee shop. So you're still doing the work portion of that, the second space, but you're in a uh, atmosphere that's different than your home or your office or your school. So you're taking yourself out of the physical space, but you're still doing the work of that physical space in a public area. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. Similarly, if you're a parent, you can go to a restaurant and have dinner with a friend, but you still will have your phone on you and you can still be reached for if a babysitter or your spouse or a caretaker has a question or needs to tell you something. You still have that connection to the real world, but yet you're also getting undivided attention and time to be social without distraction. And the final space would be a private space, like your home, your apartment, your living area. 
I think a huge part of epicenters of friendship being successful is that there's a comfort associated with them. For example, you may be able to escape at a concert or theater, but you still have to navigate your way downtown or find parking or dress up for those events. So it isn't always the simplest way to gather. Whereas I was thinking about a private space often has little to no planning involved or maybe a route your brain can maneuver on autopilot. So we see this in the original examples given a place like Eric's basement in that 70s show. The idea is that they can either drive there or walk there. They all live within a certain locational area and they're able to get to Eric's house by parking their cars. And the ability to get there is not, it doesn't take that much work. It doesn't take that much brain power. They know where Eric lives. They've been going there for years and it's just very comfortable because it's within his home. It's their own private space in the basement, similar to like Joey and Chandler's apartment or Rachel and Monica. Like they all live in the same building. They can maneuver to the different apartments. The doors are always open, kind of an open door policy. And they're all friends and they all have this boundary of respect of coming over into their living areas, but they also know that they're welcome anytime. It's kind of that private space that doesn't take a lot of work to plan out. So I was thinking about which one of my friends I feel like is really good about opening their private home for friendship gatherings. And I would say my friend Megan and her husband Matt really hit the nail on the head with this one. They not only open their home every Thursday for our Bible study, but anytime there's a birthday or a celebration or a gathering, I feel like they are the first people to offer their home up. And the thing that's interesting about it is I think that like there's nothing necessarily extravagant about the way that they go about it. Like at the most on Thursday nights, we get like a hot chocolate and then we just sit in her basement and we talk about whatever book we read from the Bible that week. Like it's very simple. And I think that's what makes epicenters of friendship so nice. I don't know what the word would be, but like so comfortable is that there isn't this air to it. Like Eric's basement didn't have to be clean all the time for them to come there. Like they didn't have to prepare a meal every time they showed up or they didn't have to have anything big planned. They just came together and they talked and they chatted and then they also <laughs> did other things um, around a round table if you've ever watched the show. But I think Megan is such a great host because she just makes her home so comfortable. I wanted to talk about these subjects because they've been really heavy on my heart the last few months and not just the adult friendship part of it and how that's growing and changing, but also the idea of homes and where I gather and which friends only want to go out when we can go out to a nice restaurant or a coffee shop or spend money and which friends invite me over to their home. And it's really been convicting for me, like when I have a house of my own, how I want my house to work and how I want it to feel and what I want my friendships to be like and how I want the interactions to go within my house. I'm really grateful that I'm living with my parents currently, but it has opened my eyes to what a gift it is to have a space where your friends can gather and it's private and you don't have to worry about if your family's coming in and out. There's kind of a joy to that of having your own space. Obviously, if you have children or you're married, like your spouse and your kids are going to come in and out from time to time, but there is a joy. And I would especially say, because traditionally in the United States, like women stay home, I would say if you're a man watching this, really being considerate about being able to take your children out. And that not only blesses you like as a father to have little dates and like be close to your kids, but also it blesses your wife or your significant other to have that freedom to not be distracted or feel like they have to be in parent mode when their friends are over. I think that's really a blessing. I think it also had me realizing that I would love like an open door policy at my home in the future. I put this on my vision board for 2023, but when I have a home, I really want to have an open door situation. And that comes with having an understanding of respect and boundaries with friends and family. And so as hard as 2022 was, because I had to create a lot of boundaries and a lot of just standards and kind of protection, 
I think that that is setting the hard groundwork for the future and what I want. I really noticed this in Los Angeles when I visited in March, how Anna's roommates, as I mentioned, they are all friends and there was five of them, but then also their friends could kind of come in and out. They had an understanding that their home was open and that they could host at any time and that people were always welcome. And obviously if something happened where someone was really struggling or needed private time, that could be discussed and that was respected. But for the most part, the door was open. Just give, you know, give a heads up through a text that you're coming over or you want to hang out, something like that. It really opened my eyes when I came back to Minnesota, how we will be like, oh, do you want to hang out? And it's like, oh yeah, I'm free in three weeks. And then you deep clean your house and you make this huge meal and it just feels like this big production. And it's like, I don't really think that your friends are looking for that. I don't think that your friends need all that. And I think if you ask them, they would tell you that. But there's this weird pressure, and I don't know if it's a Midwest thing. I would love to know this in the comments or um, just as you guys are listening, let me know in person. Is it a Midwest thing that we very much feel like we have to put on this, not a show, but like this almost like be presentable and we have to prepare our homes and we have to prepare this lavish meal and we have to do all this stuff. And it's almost like, I feel like it's a barrier between me and my friends because it's like, I don't expect you to clean your house for me to come over. And of course, that's with the mindset that their house isn't like disgusting. But the problem is that I think too many people think their house is disgusting when it's just like normally dirty. You know what I mean? Like if you have kids, I expect you to have toys on the floor. Like if you have children, I expect that there's some dirty dishes if anything, it provides an ability for me as a friend to help and to serve and to give back to you in being able to wash some dishes. I just think there's too much of like this barrier in friendships of like being presentable and your house is at its best and almost like you don't have these children, but it's like, I want to interact with you in your real life and I want to interact with you in your real home. And I don't want to feel like I'm imposing because that makes me uncomfortable as a guest. But I think it also portrays to your children that we can only have people over when we're at our best. And we have this then this mindset that goes into social media too, right? That we only present ourselves when we are at our best. And I think real friends can see you at your worst and you don't have to put on um, a character or you don't have to put on a show in order to feel a connection with people. In fact, I think real friendships spur from those moments of hardship and being able to be there together. And although they're not great memories, it's like that really proves who is your friend and who isn't. I think being able to just show up at somebody's house. And again, what I would want in my future home is that people would be as comfortable within my home as they are in their own homes. Again, there's a boundary to that. I don't want I just feel like people will take things to an extreme, but I want people to be able to come into my home and know where the silverware is and know how to make a snack. And I don't want them to feel bad about it. Like that's, it's not, oh, you eat a snack at my house and I have to go to your house and eat one of your snacks. Or like, oh, you come to my house and I have it all clean and your house magically has to be cleaned up. I don't like this give and take, um, equality situation because the reality is if you have friends in different life stages, your life isn't going to be equal. I'm going to have more time to clean my home and to prepare a meal than someone who is married with children. That's just the facts of life. And I think that's the joy of having an overlap in life stages. And if we keep pretending like we're living lives that are perfect all the time, that really creates a boundary and a barrier that's unhealthy that doesn't allow people to really be friends or to really connect in the way that they would if we're constantly trying to to one up the other person and I don't think that's how people view it but I think that's how it comes across is like I need to be the best and I need to be better and my home needs to be like exquisite and no one's asking you for that with all that in mind I'm going to wrap up this podcast but I have a couple prompts for you guys to follow along with and answer in the comments or let me know in real life. Text me the answers if you want to. The first prompt is, do you feel like you have friends, like a friend group or individual friends who all have you in common at the center? 
Which do you feel like you fall into which category? The second prompt is to let me know what you prefer most, third spaces, public spaces, or private spaces. Which one are you most comfortable in and or where do you find your friend groups most fall into? Do they fall into going to escape to things? Do they go more of the middle ground or is it more within your homes? And the final prompt is what kind of home would you like to have in the future or what kind of home have you created? And if you have created that home already, are you happy with how your home is or has this podcast made you think about how you approach friendships and having friends at your house? Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to like this video if you're watching on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe on YouTube by going to my channel, Kaylee O'Connor, with an O-R at the end. Or if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, go ahead and subscribe to the gratis group chat on there. I will see you guys in the next podcast. Let me know what you thought about this below. Give me feedback on the first two episodes, and I hope to talk to you soon.